Okay, so in this video, um, we'll be creating a PBL. And um, how we're going to do that, we're going to answer four questions. We're calling the central questions. Um, we're going to ask, what is a PBL? Why would I use a PBL in my classroom? Are they all the same? And how do I create PBL experiences in my classroom? So this is going to be a very informal video, but at the end of the day, you'll be able to um, create a PBL. So right off the bat, the first question is, what is a PBL? So a, a PBL is, um, PBL stands for Project Based um, Learning. You can write it like that or you can write it like that. <clears throat> so, um, essentially, it has uh, some characteristics that differs from a project, and we're going to make that distinction. Um, so, we got a project, to so put a row below, project, and a PBL. All right. Okay. <clears throat> now, um... You could make a project that is very PBL-like. It's not very hard-coded. Um, essentially, this is my inter interpretation. I've done many and was, was very successful. But I was very successful for a lot of reasons that had nothing to do with the, uh, with the PBL itself. And um, it sort of wouldn't be fair um, to expect... Um, a teacher who, uh, let me get this screen, sorry about that, a little finicky. <clears throat> it, wouldn't it wouldn't be fair to expect a teacher who doesn't have any PBL support in their school, doesn't have any peers who have done PBLs, or has PBL experience, um, to get the same results. Now, the, a lot of people who, a lot of play, uh, schools that practice PBLs, <clears throat> when they do have success, I think they're not really cognizant of why the success takes place. Um, there's other support factors, but we're, we'll get to there. So a project, essentially, um, it um, is, is supposed to um, be a vehicle uh, in which uh, students show mastery of... Um, learning standards that, you know, are imposed upon teachers. And I'll say opposed because at the end of the day, I agree with them. <clears throat> but as a new teacher, and I found it being very, it's, 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 it's very imposing. Um, now, PBLs are, they are not... Um, what did I call them? Mastery of learning standards are not are not um, standards based. All right. <clears throat> now that can come across in the wrong way. Like, why would I do that? It's not standards based. You know, I teach my students according to standards. Why? Because um, administrators hold us against that. Why? Because the state holds us against that for the most part. Why? Because funding and all this stuff is tied on the performance of schools. And if the schools don't perform well, then we're in trouble. And how do they measure? Um, you know, they all measure. Let's do this. Emerge cell. They're measured on, uh, like, benchmark, you know, common core, um, statewide tests. <clears throat> um, for the most part, it's a test. And that really kind of determines a lot. And it's kind of unfair, but, you know, that's just how it is. So, uh, I'll just delete that row. Um, Alright, so going to projects. What about projects? Um, they tend to be, like regurgitation regurgitations of 
what the teacher has taught and expects and, and expects and that makes sense right because if you're in an English class and you're teaching um, all these standards uh, you, you you want you want the students to be able to like for instance in the common core you you want the student to determine the meaning of words and phrases and evaluate the advantages and disadvantages of different mediums. Um, you're going to want them to do all this stuff. And so basic examples of projects are going to be like dioramas, um, PowerPoint, presentations, you know, over chapters or a book. Um, it can be, uh, some physical kind of model, um, you know, that represents, like, concepts in biology, or, um, habitat, or, um, going back to the diorama, if it's in English, oops, <coughs> um, and, all right, so in PBL, what do we have? Um, um, they solve a real world-like problem, all right? They, um, oh, they solve, okay, they have, they are embedded with, you know, common core, um, common core uh, and um, you know, standards. Okay. They involve like um, they involve, I guess, professional competencies. Um, they, they so these don't necessarily involve that in a project. <clears throat> if you're making a diorama. Um, there aren't professional competencies. There are, and what do I mean by that? I mean, let's just kind of keep it real. Like, imagine yourself in an environment, in a work setting, but a specific work setting. Um, we're not necessarily talking like a supermarket work setting. Because a supermarket work setting is, um, it's a real world setting. But in those settings, they, they don't really approach it in collaborative settings. You're not having dialogues and discussions and brainstorming on how to cut and slice meat or how to stock stuff. And these things are globally one of the most important uh, um, professions to have societally to keep the world functioning. So this is not a critique on people who have that. Where I've worked in these settings for the better part of my life in and out. Um, this is not a critique of that. This is just saying what a PBL isn't, okay? It's not a supermarket work setting. It's essentially this type of setting, an engineer, engineering setting or some type of, like, governmental role, typically hybrid, hybridation between the two. Um, yeah, I'm not spelling stuff, and I'm using some of my own kind of wor uh, words, probably, and that's okay. All right, so let's get some space. So what what do I mean? So let's just rate this. So we're going to say professional competencies, um, and what do I mean by that? Um, let's see. Trying to just copy this right here. So, in, so in the engineering jobs, we have collaboration. We have role responsibility, which at the end of the day, in projects, you do have roles. Let's just be real. You have roles. You have rubrics. You do have that. So you have role responsibility, but I would say you have... Um, no, it's the same. You both you, you do have rubric role responsibility. Um, 
but you do have it here too. So let's highlight how they're similar. I mean, there's a lot, there, there are similarities between the two. You do have those in common. Um, <clears throat> so you have collaborations, the big thing, uh, role responsibility. You have creative, um, creative um, product making. Um, you have that here. I'll say semi, um, semi create. No, you know what? I've seen it before. You know what? I, I, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> it's actually I'll call it template uh, creativity. That's what you have here um, within a template. And the odd thing is I'm going to use that word template here, but I actually think um, you have created product making here. You provide templates um, to have learners succeed, definitely, because it's more of a professional real problem. And um, so that's in the professional competencies. Um, we did say they're real world problems. These are like school world problems. Um, I think that's pretty much it right there. That's kind of the, the big difference is they both uh, do presentations. Um, so <clears throat> what is a PBL? Um, a PBL is a type of project process that um, that have students work collaborate collaboratively in groups to solve a real world problem generating like authentic authentic and and realistic solutions um, while you know, you know, on the other hand, um, uh, projects are I would say student, like they're like student centered, like pro uh, uh, projects that are typically not set out to resolve real world solutions um, and have template like creativity. <clears throat> so um, this is from what I've seen. So for instance, I've seen like projects, you know, the dioramas, like for instance, like students are making like a road, like a theme park based on a book. And at the end of the day, you know, these, uh, it's, it's not solving a real world solution because a real world, so let's, let's, let's look at some counterparts. So, so let's look at some counterpart solutions here. So insert row below, uh, sorry. So here's the, here are some examples. So create a roller coaster that embodies the theme of a novel. So I've seen a project look like that. A PBL wouldn't, if it were driven by roller coasters, it says, how can we create roller coasters that, that what? And it has to solve a problem. So usually roller coasters are huge. They're found in theme parks. They're not readily available in every city because um, costs money. So it might be in more like well-to-do like part cities within a state. So how can we create roller coasters? Um, roller coasters. Uh, how can we create um, theme? Or see if it were roller coasters, how could we create roller coasters that are affordable 
and implementable in lower in income states. See, that would be a PBL question. <clears throat> so you can already imagine um, the kind of legwork that you would need to do. In this one, it's lower stakes. Um, at the end of the day, everyone knows what a roller coaster looks like. Um, we can just go to image search the web. We can type in roller coaster. And we all know it has um, their sinusoidal per, you know, patterns and they go up and down, they curl, they go straight, they do big hills. So at the end of the day, you're going to see projects where students use popsicle sticks and you know straws and such and you know that when you look at all the projects there's a large hill there's a smaller hill this hill is more sturdy um, this one is more colorful this theme is more imaginative and such and it does show a lot of creativity <clears throat> and it can get complex but at the end of the day if you copied and pasted that right here, that would be a failed uh, project turned in. Because how does that show um, that this, this structure is implementable in lower income states? So in this one, <clears throat> what the, it requires more skills. So let's talk about the skills that are required here. The skills that are required here, um, is low how to use uh, Google Docs. Um, apologize, I'm trying to find the buttons here. <laughs> there. So the skills is know the novel. Wait, know the theme of the novel. That's all you have to know. <clears throat> you don't really have to know the climax. You don't really have to know. Um, well, you kind of do, but it's not necessarily that important because a theme can be. Um, communicated orally <laughs> and given some evidence and you don't necessarily need to know all the the elements of plot in a story to the to the level you would need to perhaps meet the standards of the common core uh, you wouldn't you would just need to know the theme the bigger question is how does it relate to here um, so for this one this is probably more this is probably I would say high school level right here well, this one is definitely uh, elementary, middle school, and high school as well. Um, we'll have to explain the further questions how we get there. But at the end of the day, in a PBL, when we do in implement different disciplines and the Common Core, we there are means to embed it. For instance, let me just show. It's like so. For instance, um, if you're just focusing more on nonfiction you would be focusing on extracting like textual evidence to support uh, the main idea, um, you know, inference and such. And at the end of the day, you do that um, through um, the research that the students use in order to inform their decisions on, um, on making this design. So this is how in a very snapshot how uh, common core concepts are implemented in a PBL. <clears throat> but let's kind of get back to this side right here before we get to this side. So you know the theme of the novel and you have creativity and you know make, uh, create metaphorical creativity, right? This metaphorical creativity um, towards the design only. That's pretty much um, the project right there. Um, <clears throat> teachers will kind of embed like, um, we'll say how certain parts of the rides are thematic to like the main character and stuff. And you can add that, but that's all you have. But here, in order to solve this question, you have to do a lot more. Basically, at the end of the day, um, you have to learn some concepts about economy and um, how that um, drives the purchase of um, one of these roller coasters. You have to then understand 
concepts of architecture on how things are built, why, um, why one ride would be more complicated. And I know what you're thinking, this is too advanced. Why would I do that? How would I do that? <clears throat> but it's so easy as making it a mini lesson and providing a YouTube video where experts do talk about that and then unpacking that into certain criteria that you have in your rubric and, and having expectations. It might just be that <clears throat> to fill this requirement of the rubric, you, you, front, you provide some three to four um, articles um, that you parsed yourself. Um, maybe they're excerpts, a couple paragraphs, or they're snippets of videos um, where students then have to be able to provide one or two pieces of text evidence in their presentation to fulfill this, um, per, um, fulfill this um, aspect of the rubric. Your rubric can be, you know, four rows driven or it can be more complex where you get little components like this. And, it's, and, I, and I recommend having a more dynamic rubric <clears throat> because it does a lot of things when you do projects. So typically, and it kind of shows the problem on uh, what, what we have with classical projects. Classical projects, when they're graded, they seem to be very um, arbitrary. But when you do a PBL, your rubrics are essentially stacked where it isn't arbitrary. The X lands on that part of the column from, you know, low, medium, high, and then we use different words, but it lands in that rubric where it gives um, precise feedback to the group of students and the student themselves. So you're starting to see a theme right here that there are multiple rubrics, usually two. One for, um, uh, well, the way I do it, I usually, or you can comprise them all in one, but I usually have two rubrics, one that represents a team grade and the other represents an individual grade. So there's a lot of feedback. There's a lot of accountability. There's a lot of resources for the student to know exactly what they have to do um, to succeed. And that's where these classical projects fail. They, they fail, I believe, sometimes because students are not too sure on what to do and why. <clears throat> when you create rules for um, in, in the kind of ecosystem of a PBL, there's resources that set up that student for success. While in typical projects, while they could have similar um, aspects like that, um, what I've seen personally, and this can, this can happen with PBLs too, and it's happened as well, that there's one student who does all the work, and there's one student that presents. Or projects are open-ended, and there aren't rubrics specifying the roles, and, and you just say don't know more than four students. So it can be done by one to four, but there's no specific instructions and guidance and roles for what one student, uh, what those students are to do, especially it's problematic that if you have it open-ended and you say no more than four, there's no, at the end of the day, now you have four people, you have one student doing all the work and three just coasting on. And then what I've seen is like behavioral problems. And, and at the end of the day, the project is not really boosting. It's not, it's not some kind of assessment, which actually helps the students um, do better in these kind of tests and actually do better um, globally in their in, in the less in the, in the lessons or in the class in general. <clears throat> so right off the bat, you can see how it it has. Um, if we go back here, um, they solve real problems, and they are bedded with Common Course, uh, and they have professional competency. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> Basically these students will have roles. And if we want to just simplify it, basically, like in an, in an engineer, in any kind of job role in the real world, um, well, typically, the administrator, they have roles and responsibilities. They're there to, you know, encourage, guide, and offer, like, solutions in order to, you know, when what? At the end of the day, 
in order to do this, make the product better and bigger, more efficient, more rewarding. But in a typical real world, like in many jobs, it's broken into two types of jobs. Learn how to um, do this product. So the product, it caps at like this level. And then the expectation for some jobs is to do this. That's it. To always create the same product, you don't want this product to be less. <laughs> Essentially, you don't even want this product to be better. You just want it. And, and at the end of the day, the, the irony is that I understand how this is a dud. Oops, sorry. I understand how this is a dud. But why would this be a dud? But in some, eh, some work settings, in the real world, these are both duds because what they want is uniformity. But that's not how the PBL works and that's not how a lot of um, jobs industries work like the tech industry and engineering. At the end of the day, you want things better. You want it better and you also want it more efficient because if it's more efficient, it's, it's less costly and there's more profits. But that's how PBLs work. PBLs work under this idea that these groups of students were interested in what insight they have to offer, their creativity and their real-world problem-solving skills. So let's talk about, let's just erase this, and let's talk about what the outcomes are. The outcomes you see here are this. Their products, they're the same. They're the same thing. And you're like, but the only thing different is they're just a different shade of the same. They're derivatives of the same thing and not necessarily in the positive way. They're, uh, they're derivatives in, 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 in their sameness. Um, like that. <clears throat> basically, and basically maybe this one's just a little bigger and that's how it looks like in a classic setting. But in, in the PBL setting, I mean, things are obviously different. Like, they use a different font, a um, uh, different color. Um, you know, you know, object uh, for production. Um, the spelling's different. You, you notice, you're going to notice that. So when I, the first year I taught this, and um, what I did my, so my PBL question is probably one of the toughest ones I've ever done, and it was the first one. And the question, the central question was, how can we, um, um, uh, how can we, how can we create uh, affordable structures for um, disaster relief? <clears throat> so, you know, when there's floods and hurricanes and all that kind of stuff and homes are destroyed, structure, infrastructure is destroyed, um, buildings are leveled, you know, things aren't safe. And this was for uh, an eighth grade population. Um, how can we create these affordable structures that are quickly erected, um, you know, and can be used to actually have people go in there and be kind of safe from the elements. So I front, you know, I, I front loaded, you know, architecture um, structures from Buck Minster Fuller. Um, I and some people looked at uh, um, what, and then um, we talked about, um, we looked at Google Maps. And we looked at um, the school's con area. And so we, 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 I taught a little bit about site analysis. Um, then um, we talked a little bit about costs, just a little bit. So I saw projects where <laughs> it was at a college level where uh, some groups, not all of them, um, actually had a spreadsheet and talked about how much their structure would cost. They talked about how some of the connections would be made. 
they talked about what they did and they provided a model. I've seen beautiful models um, with wood and, and foam balls and making beautiful uh, um, uh, uh, structures uh, that look very rigid and, and another thing were to scale. So they learned about architectural scale and that, you know, one inch represents five feet, six feet, something like that. <clears throat> and they had cutouts of people and they actually fit in there. And one project looked pretty much like this, but a lot of projects did not look like that. They looked square-like. They weren't very, um, if you type in his structure, you'll understand what I mean. I'm just having a lapse in memory. <clears throat> but it was one of the most vivid pro um, presentations I've ever had. And um, it won one of the best in like prize um, presentations um, and where the students had to present to all the parents of um, the, the um, STEM students. So basically you start to see the rigor, you start to see the involvement. At the end of the day, it's kind of crazy. It's like the common core is, becomes the given knowledge. See, that's what's really important, kind of crazy when you when you build, you have to build up to the ability to do PBLs like this. It's not going to be, um, you're not going to do it your first time. <clears throat> and there's a reason why I did it my first time, because I'm great. No, sorry. That's not why. It's because I had a great support team, and not a lot of schools have that. We actually have, like, a, an actual STEM department, um, STEM specialists. Um, there were teachers doing it for years. We have meetings, we have PD specifically for this, and we have PD that actually helps you structure your project. Um, we were given essentially a couple of days to actually create this in teams with experts. So that's why um, when I did my first one, it hit, you know, it, it hit so high. Um, so that being said, my audience is trying to be like, if you're trying to create a PBL and you don't have any support, you don't have anyone there, how do I do it? How do I start it? Well, you're probably not going to want to start it like this. I would not recommend doing something like this. You might want to start not even doing this, doing something simpler than this. So I hope you have under get an understanding what a PBL is. So the next question is, why would I use um, PBL? Uh, PBLs in my classroom. This is a very simple question. Um, our, the scores, uh, there was like always like a, an average of 25% increase in like benchmark um, exams that were given by the school, not the statewide ones, but more of the regional, um, um, the regional pertaining to the school um, that performed better than all student populations. And to make this important, like our student body was made from a lottery, so it's it represents a typical classroom. It's a mixture of all types of students. It's not a GT or pre AP or on level. Um, it has all types of students from all walks of life. Uh, so those school those scores were a representative, um, and at the end of the day, it performed higher than the pre AP students. And those students, all those students in that classroom are based on how they performed in um, benchmark testing year at the year at the end at the end of the year. But the student population we had didn't. But to be fair, I think honestly, if we look at that 25% gain, this is what I think. 25% um, gain better than all um, uh, well, this is, yeah, better compared to the other um, um, cohorts. I feel, in my opinion, like 15% of that did not even come from me. It could have been more than that, to be honest. It, so that didn't come from me. I think, yeah, I think around 10% came from me. <clears throat> but it could have been less. Um, the 15% came because it... They had a system in place, um, system place of experts um, guiding. And, you know, typical teachers go through PD and they go through the same cohorts. 
the same content specialist, um, kind of drill and kill, um, going through expectations. But in these settings, that's not what was going on with those specialists. They weren't drilling and killing. They were doing a lot of hands-on activities um, that had us learn kind of essentials in PBL making. Essentially, we would make PBLs and we would see the shortcomings, uh, learning about pacing, learning about front loading, le learning about um, activities to help students um, collaborate and work together, learning about activities, how to break up groups um, in a way. One of the coolest things that I liked, and you don't see this in um, classical projects, um, so basically why PBLs in my classroom, it provides a higher level of like organization um, to be able to work with individual students. So we, it, everyone does small groups and you t people do small groups this way, but it's not through PBL, it might be through TEKS or Common Core. So the idea is that, you know, students who are performing low on one standard, like inference, these students are pulled out while the whole class is doing an activity and the teacher works with them on an individual basis. Or you do stations um, that target um, weaker points and students rotate to these activities. But in the PBL setting, what's kind of interesting, I mean, a lot of hardcore teachers can already do this, <clears throat> but what's interesting is when you're kind of, when you're like 20% into that PBL, into the timeline of a PBL, you're going to see students working in their groups. They're, they're doing things. So you, you have the ability to pull out, like, let's say if there's one, two, three, four roles, and let's say this role, you know, you always have this in project, they're more of the leadership role. They're not really in charge of the creation right now or um, the research or the presentation. And what you do is you can pull them out and then you can give them a mini lesson. And then that day or the following day, they can implement what they do, perhaps as a, as a given another activity for the role to help support um, the functioning of these roles to actually start completing the project. That's what's kind of cool. So at the end of the day, why would I use PBLs in my classroom? It creates better autonomy. It creates better flow. Um, you're not micromanaging. That's the thing that you don't do. You are not micromanaging. Um, you are not like, what if you did this? Oh, you know, this idea you have is great, but why don't you do it this way? I've noticed that when, when, Pete, when projects are happening, it's more like, hey, your ideas are cool and all, but wouldn't it be cool if you do my idea and make that happen? There's a more, more of an onus to do that rather than just, um, in PBLs, that's not how it works. Um, one of the coolest things that I've learned from one of the specialists is, is they call it turning it around. When the student comes to you with, I don't know how to do that or what, how, how would I do this, um, when they're putting it on you, you ask it, you just turn it around on them and you say, look, you have the abilities to do that. You, 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 you can figure it out. You're putting the work on them and like in a real world setting. Like, for instance, if you were a manager somewhere, you wouldn't go not go to the next, or I guess, go to another manager and say, hey, can you manage these five people for me because I don't know how to do it. The, the onus is on them to do that, to be able to manage them. You know, whether they, they, they sink or fail or... You know, there's, there's ups and downs in that, and in the PBL setting, it's embraced. But I feel classically in a project setting, um, failure means you got a 70 or you got a 60. Um, so PBL, I feel it's kind of, it's more, it's, it's better for autonomy, and it's better for kind of like uh, the climate of the classroom. Um, so are all the PBLs the same? No. So there are many PBLs. And they're like full PBLs. And at the end of the day, I would, I would structure myself to start with mini PBLs. So what are mini PBLs? Um, so basically, this is, let's talk about what all PBLs have. They, they all have this right here. All PBLs 
have these uh, things. PBL, PBL criteria. All right. Um, so PBLs, they have, um, first thing they have is they have um, an essential question. Um, they have rubrics. They have roles and product outcomes and presentations. So and you can look at this and it looks pretty much this is what projects have. And it is very true. Um, um, projects do have that. Um, but the way this is used for PBLs is a lot different. Um, so let's talk about how we can do this for a mini PBL. So an essential question for like a mini PBL is, um, let's say we're looking at nonfiction, okay? And, and then every, we separate the class into eight groups. And <clears throat> they have the same article, okay? So you give them a question like, how, um, what, uh, let me see, as, as a professional in this field, how would you evaluate, uh, how, um, how would you evaluate, um, how would you evaluate the expertise um, in this article? So let's say it was an article on um, on uh, um, the author's tr the author's intent is the main idea is um, AI will have a negative in you know impact in the world um, you know out uh, job labor decreases. Um, automation um, automation lowers pay gap blah 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 he makes all these points <clears throat> so um, so that's the essential question right there let's keep that in mind um, how would you evaluate the expertise in the article and this can actually go through like grades like six through eight um, for an elementary level I wouldn't do that but for middle school and high school <clears throat> this can even go into the college level essentially um, so then you have rubrics. So the rubric is, let's say it has four roles. There's going to be, um, uh, let's, call it the, let's call it the pacer. Um, this guy is the researcher. Um, this, pers um, this person is um, the assessor. And this person is um, kind of the group orator. All right. So as the pacer, um, you you know you designate a like let's say you know a eight minute individual um, individual read, and you go over um, simple um, annotation strategy as an expectation. So they're they're doing a little. They're doing a little um, mini lesson on it. It's gonna be a strategy that we've already taught, but it's just reinforcing that. <laughs> and um, that's one of the roles. And then the second role is um, um, guide discussion. This is a skill that you would have taught. Guide discussion with open questions and allow um, the floor to be, you know, like a minute at a time. All right, <clears throat> so the researcher, what they're going to do is find supporting or uh, supporting evidence um, for, uh, for and against the author's um, uh, main idea. And they're, um, so, this in this activity, so they would have to read it. So maybe during the discussion, while it's happening, they're they're given maybe another eight minutes or so 
to just provide that, but you're going to have taught many lessons on how <clears throat> just to find some evidence that supports uh, an idea that you have, and then you're presenting it, um, presenting it uh, to um, to team, and the assessor is um, they're the one. Uh, let's say we might might even do this into three roles because I feel like this is the same. We can say uh, the assessor or um, the orator here is making their compelling case and getting getting um, team feedback. Um, so that's one of the things. Maybe they're flexible, changing to group consensus or not, and they lead the presentation um, um, with final view, um, ensuring everyone contributes something orally. So this could be done, I would say maybe in two days, maybe a whole, so, so um, these are the roles and we can, we can, and then you can create a rubric of um, like, for instance, we can create a simple rubric, just a simple rubric where there's a table. Uh, let's see if this is enough. Um, um, let's say, um, great, exceptional master. There we go. Mass, uh, um, doesn't matter. And then <clears throat> let's see, um, let's do insert. Um, yeah, we can do it that way. And here we can just do it where it's just uh, uh, kind of like a major grade for the group. So um, let's say you can just put. Uh, pacer, researcher, just like that, orator, and then we can have insert row below, and we can have presentation, and, you know, um, great um, student, let's say a great one you designated, um, student insured learners read, and um, and um, although not everyone participated, uh, and then we, we just go to the ranks, um, students, um, pacer. And then you can say here, pacer ensured um, participation and annotation for their group. All right. <clears throat> Everyone did exactly what they're supposed to. Pacer, um, pacer, um, pacer's involvement led to a um, robust understanding of the problem. There you go. <clears throat> So there's one thing to just do the work and know what the material said. <clears throat> there's a there's another thing to have um, uh, so um, understanding of the problem by uh, by the problem since each role contributed um, original responses. So this kind of clues in that <clears throat> they. They all had their own research. They all made their inferences. They weren't just conceding, oh, that's a good idea, I'll run with it. So that's what a master um, kind of involvement would look like. You can always do it where, if this is a, a good 25, um, maybe this is a 20, maybe this is a, uh, I'm sorry, I can't count. This is a 25, maybe this is um, 
a 20. And if, if they don't get an X here, that means they didn't do any of it. So that means that's just a zero. Or maybe there's an optional gradient where you can say 10 to 20, where there is some wiggle room. So it isn't so black and white. But maybe this is the 30 right here. This is kind of what I did. This is a 30. So now you have five points for a major grade that I actually put towards something that you didn't do so well. So that, so you kind of create that all out. It's a very simple rubric. Um, and I say if you're starting out, <clears throat> maybe this takes three days, three um, class periods, this mini PBL. So uh, you go about um, talking about the problem with a hook, talking about, um, you know, who's heard of AI, here are some implementations of it. Um, you know, we have systems like BARD and ChatGPT now that are, uh, through language models, are talking in such complexities that it just seems like a real person. And, and then, you know, what are your thoughts on this? And get, and get your class's involvement. Maybe you make an anchor chart um, where they determine what the pros and cons are. And I would recommend that because that's a lot of uh, uh, background knowledge. Then you segue into this kind of essential question. Well, according to Elon Musk, here are his ideas of, I mean, I heard this guy wants to put a chip in someone's brain. Here are some of his ideas. He wrote an article, or maybe you write an article inspired by some of his stuff. Um, you know, this is where the teacher can create resources. I've done that in the past because I couldn't find a resource that was appropriately for the grade level I was giving. And, you know, when you give something too hot, the thing is, when you give something, a resource that's too high level, it should be, it should be scaffolded, right? Like Vygotsky said, you know, it should be in the zone of proximal learning slightly to that certain point, maybe 10, 15, whatever that percent higher so they can actually get to a higher peak. I understand that. What I'm talking about is when resources are just way, way um, harder than their comprehension. And, and what happens? The teacher is doing their song and dance, parsing through the whole article, giving them all the stuff, and it's just too much. You're spoon-feeding them. And at the end of the day, no one's learning that way. I've learned that from personal experience. So this is, uh, this is a sample of a mini PBL. So how do I create uh, PBL experiences in my classroom? Mini PBLs. <clears throat> I've, I've also seen mini projects too, um, where you take, a, uh, and this is good though, um, sometimes you need to explain it to administrators too, because they're like, well, where's the teak? Where, how is it involved to um, the common core? Um, I'm looking at the common core here, and I don't see the correlation between the two. But I recommend having small activities, and this is ones I've seen, is like you give, um, and there's so many STEM projects out there, you give like 50 popsicle, you know, popsicle sticks, a rubber band, straw, and, you add, and um, a paper. You give them a timeline, you say just 25, 25 minutes and you tell them to make a catapult. And, and then you give roles like, you give roles um, uh, like, um, let's say, engineer, um, you know, the architect, um, and then um, the, uh, let me see, the scribe or something like that. And then the engineer, the architect is, or um, the, the architect's involvement is to create the blueprint. All right, and the engineer is, is, is supposed to, you know, f figure out the, um, you know, is supposed to engineer uh, with given materials um, uh, to, so it actually works. And maybe, I can't think of a name for this, so let's just keep it question mark. Maybe this is a person who's kind of like the leader. There's always like a leader giving feedback. You know, this does catapult, but it breaks after the third time. How do we make it more structural, engineer? Or, you know, this part of the design looks great, but it being too long, it, it just is harder to fling stuff. Um, if this becomes too hard to basically you could scratch out the roles in the in the beginning and just have like a basic rubric and talking about, you know, like good, great, awesome, um, um, 
works for the most part, but breaks down too fast, you know, yada, yada, yada. You can do that. You can start, and that's what I recommend if, uh, if you have no STEM background, no PBL background, no resources, start doing these little mini projects um, uh, throughout the year. Maybe like two or three um, before you do a PBL. Maybe you do a PBL towards the end of the year um, for the first year. Because all, mo all this is what I've seen through a lot of schools. You know, after they do that major, you know, statewide um, test, after they do this, um, it's like free game. And that's when um, they have like projects like design your own sneaker, you're a salesperson, be persuasive. Um, um, that could be turned into a PBL and then they, they can, they draw all this stuff and, and at the end of the day, they're just illustrations. It's not necessarily a product. Like I'll talk about some examples that I've seen that were just phenomenal. Um, so basically the, the, the theme was, um, uh, uh, I can't, it's, it's kind of a uh, reuse and and we had like different levels. Basically, uh, how how can we make products with, how can we make like uh, conscientious products for environment? So they had different levels, and uh, I remember I, I gave I gave students the choice to pick what project type you want to do the just the recycled materials, or you want to do the upcycled. So upcycled is it's like double recycle because. Upcycle takes like existing things and it it uh, tries to reuse them and repurpose them to make something that's very artistic and nice. So I seen this one student who who took a fork and he bent it and made jewelry out of it. He started making jewelry out of um, old silverware. Old, um, that was really awesome. And I had, it wasn't like, I hey, this is a cool designer. I had no idea that it could be done. Like, I felt like I didn't even influence them in any way to do that. I had one student who made a, a plush, a plushy bear out of, um, I think, a, her old blanket as a kid. Um, I had a student who was more conceptual and created an illustration of uh, um, using like old water bottles to make like a very cool planter. Um, I've seen kids who who probably are too influenced by the online and made uh, a bottle chair out of recycled plastic bottles. There were some done, but they had their research and they justified it. So at the end of the day, um, that's how I would uh, create PBL experiences. So just to recap, like what do I, what, like let's just add a new question. Like what do I really need to get started? Like at the end of the day, what, do I need and need to do uh, to get started? It is like very, I think it's very simple. So basically, you know, have an, uh, an overarching question, uh, arching question um, that solves a real world problem. Um, roles, unique roles tied, uh, tie, unique roles tied to a rubric, um, uh, rubric. This is kind of the key thing. <clears throat> you know, when I, I'm not in a PBL, there's a lot, it's more work, but to create a PBL is definitely more work create um, a PBO. I would say it's like four to ten times more work than creating a regular lesson plan. And this is, I'm making some assumptions here. I'm assumption, I'm assuming that you, you're a teacher that's worked a couple years and you have these lesson plans in a, in a bin and you're repeating, I, I, I know these teachers and we do the same thing. I repeat a lot of stuff too. So I'm not going to pretend like, hey, I, I, I don't do that. But I know teachers who literally have every lesson plan for the whole year and they literally don't do anything new the only thing they do new is when uh, you know the, the school says hey we have to implement xyz um protocol so they'll just pop it in like 
in an existing lesson. And I'm telling you, like, these teachers brag. <clears throat> they're so relaxed. But in a PBL, it's not like that. PBLs, I've seen teachers reuse PBLs too, so it can happen. But when I did it, I just created PBLs from scratch because um, this is the reason why I did it. I hate creating lesson plans every week. Like, lesson plans were always due on a Thursday or Friday, and then, you know, you're in these, like, department meetings, and you're just, like, planning with them, and everyone's talking, and it's hard to concentrate. I don't like to do that. I, I started, uh, you know, stretching my limits, and my team was cool. I started making PBLs the, <laughs> I, that was um, essentially, like, the whole units, the length of a whole unit. So if you have a six-week unit, I had a six-week PBL. Um, so you're, um, I'll talk about that. You're, uh, that's probably very advanced, and I've learned that from the pros. I didn't make this up. They were like pro PBL veterans who would do that, and they would flaunt about it. And now in the beginning, I was like, oh, my gosh, there's no way I can do that. And I do not recommend you doing that unless you have a grasp on the concepts of a PBL. I would really start mini. Like if this was your first year of doing a PBL, I'd really do these mini projects, as I said, Maybe try to incorporate content, and then after the benchmark, when it's like it's game over, just do a PBL then. It'd be more meaningful to the students, too, to do it then. It, why? Because if you do a major PBL in the beginning of the year without any coaching or guidance, you're, you're, you're probably going to fail because there's a lot of high stakes, especially if it's testing time, and now you have to cut your curriculum and go to test, and you're halfway into PBL, and you haven't really figured out the pacing to take grades, in a way, I mean, I got a lot of grades from my PBLs. I just broke it into, like, uh, small activities. Like, for instance, um, like, for instance, uh, right here, if, if we we're looking at, like, a Buckminster video on his structure, uh, students have to pull pieces of evidence from the video in quotes to be able to explain... Um, um, the success of the structure, or for this Google map, that um, they would have to make a convincing argument why why they chose this specific lot in this existing Google map image, why this would be key uh, a key place to put as a disaster relief site. Um, you, you can get little grades from every little activity you do. A PBL essentially is made up of like many teachable moments. It's if, 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 if you find that it's made of three teachable moments, then you're doing a project. And how I know this is because I got schooled many times by specialists saying, no, I'm sorry, this is, a, this is a project. This is not a PBL. And it was a hard learning curve, but it, 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 that's what happened. So going back here, we got unique roles um, tied to a rubric. We have rubrics that mainly act as guides and this is one of the most fascinating things <clears throat> I've seen like when you see students like holding to that paper that's their main thing they're um, going to um, the only thing that I really help students with is in that architectural one how to use um, like uh, certain software I remember um, I forgot what it was but oh yeah how do we create um, schools, and this was during the pandemic when we were working virtual, first year I worked virtual, and the essential question is how do we create, um, how do we create appropriate spaces in school, um, that allow for, um, something about the pandemic, I forgot what it was, <clears throat> but it had students use actual, um, architectural online apps, and I saw these 3D models that just blew my mind. Like, I, I couldn't even do it. I mean, I could, but I would have to have the motivation to do it. But it just, the designs were definitely, I, I wouldn't have come up with. They were very unique designs. And the odd thing is, too, why PBLs? These students get skills that become lifelong. This one student who really gravitated towards that. Because uh, um, in PBLs, that are different in, in programs. You, you see them through the years. And I taught 7th um, and 8th grade. I, I taught this student in seventh grade. In eighth grade, he was playing with that program on his own, creating his own designs. And then he started talking about his own architectural aspirations. And I was like, man, 
And it made me question. I never asked them, like, did this come from that project or do you always have these motivations? But I never seen it till the project came to be. So PBLs really blossom career-oriented goals. Um, in the STEM program, that's what we did. But you, you see students thinking about career goals at an early age. Um, that's kind of what goes to this question, um, why PBLs? Um, so you got these rubrics that mainly act as guides um, for grades. Um, you do have products. These are real world product outcomes. And what I mean is like they're not going to design an engine. I mean, they're, they, they're like, they become like kind of like rough drafts, schemas of what potentially could realistically happen. But <clears throat> not to harp on this one project that I've seen, but for people who, uh, who are doing projects and you're doing roller coasters with all these colors and straws that are very abstract and, and are not representational of the physical world, like those would never be built. Yes, they, they could. They could have a very, um, very hardcore engineer made it look like um, very postmodern, made it look like as if it were a student's project. Like I can understand the simile of that, but like most, so I wouldn't say never. I would say there's a less like, likely outcome that these actually represent um, a, a professional career oriented goals. These do. These lead to that. I've heard so many conversations about careers and very specific careers from students in, um, well, in the academy, but who are doing PBLs. And then there's a presentation. And so there's, there's a difference about these presentations that usually what happens is that this is where it's very big on the teacher. Like, let's say you, let's say you, this was a um, three-week PBL, right? And then let's say maybe like the first week you're, you're, um, you're um, introducing, intr introducing the PBL, um, you're doing, um, um, you're doing a Q and A, a Q and A, there's anchor charts out, out in the room uh, where this is the part where students are, you're, they're looking, usually make like a packet for them. It's kind of like, you know, here's the essential question. Here's the rubrics. Here are some graphic organizers to help you. I forgot to include that. So um, there are graphic organizers. Insert row below. There's graphic organizers. And these are like, you know, sentence starters. Um, there's charts uh, that students plug in their knowledge about the expectations of the PBL and provide their research and you know involvement in the PBL so what that's how i got a lot great a grades from usually this document um and I forgot to talk about the uh, the actual um, model for the PBLs, um, but basically, I you the the model is pretty much like I'm gonna simplify it. There is a phase of asking questions. There's a, a phase of brainstorming. There's a there's a phase of um, uh, kind of creating, and there's a phase of evaluating, and there's a phase of um, pre-presentation. Okay, evaluating and updating. I would say evaluating and updating, and there's a, a phase of pre-presentation and presentation. So those are the phases of a PBL. <clears throat> so like, what we would essentially do is like. They asking questions where you're making anchor charts. So you say, hey, students, now that we've looked at the requirements, 
<clears throat> what are some questions? And typically students won't say they don't have questions, so then you come up with questions in your anchor chart, and you and then on a T-chart, you provide the answer for that, where to find certain things. And it's usually like, um, um, what are we doing? Essential question. When is this due? This date. What are some major grades in this PBL? Just basically breaking up that kind of document for them in a more graphic sense in the anchor chart. So when they do get to the classroom, <clears throat> they're not fumbling their fingers and just saying, you know what, since I don't know what to do, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. That has mitigated a lot more with PBLs. So asking questions, usually it's like the, at the, the intro, you know, ask um, question. I say it's usually like two days. And then brainstorming is usually like um, two days as well. Because depending how you structure it, um, if it's more group oriented, um, the creating is where the, 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 the body of the chunk is. So I would say like half the time, but in between those, you are um, pulling small groups. Just to check on each group, check on the role, checking that document. And that's what the document is so cool because <clears throat> it's, it's pretty much represents all their student grades uh, for the most part. But you can use that as a document to check their learning. If you're pulling um, everyone who's the um, designer role, you, you get to, if you're asking an open question, and if you're not getting a lot of um, feedback, you can just have them open that part. And if you see it blank, then now, you know, a couple days in, we can address that rather than waiting to the last second and they turn in a document that's not even filled, which has happened to me. So I recommend this is when you start pulling small groups and when you see a trend for certain classes or maybe all in general they're just totally missing one thing you pause the PBL and you reintroduce a mini lesson to help that part that's what you're doing for like half the time I would say for uh, the second half then what you're uh, what you're doing is um, you're having them evaluate and update so this might be a thing where, let's say if they were trying to create a more affordable um, kind of roller coasters for low income states or something like that, you're you're going to one to, maybe one day you're spending time on two groups, um, and um, or you're walking through all the groups and seeing a common trend and having kind of like a closure statement saying, hey, I noticed this trend of doing these very elaborate structures, but we're missing the concept of what like low income means, you know, and then maybe the next day you see them, you provide a resource that perhaps like a video that might show, I know there's people who make their own kind of roller coasters at home, or maybe rather than it being a traction system, it's a pooling system on a slippery surface, redefining what it means to be on a ride like that. And then maybe, this kind of video then gives them that aha moment that like they don't have to be like tied to uh, what um, a roller coaster is. So that, that's during the evaluating and updating. And then when you kind of get to a point where students are like around 70% done, I wouldn't do any higher than that. Then you start um, giving lessons on um, what a presentation looks like, like a mini lesson and work with students to be able to have their presentation. Maybe this is a PowerPoint, a slide where they take images, show documentation, and then you actually have them present amongst their peers, maybe like three days before the real presentation. And then as a class with little feedback forms, they provide their scribbles. You're not giving them the feedback. You can, you can give them the scribbles and you, you dump it to that, that role that's most responsible and they're in charge of uh, communicating that. On presentation day, usually it's bigger. You have sometimes the principal jumps in or the specialist jump in, some parents jump in, and they watch that presentation. And then students are more like, uh, they're, they're, they're more, they have more stakes into it because it's real for them. Rather, when I've seen projects where when it's all done, you got three students, four students, one's mumbling, it's really hard to pull words from them. Class awkwardly claps and walks away. With PBLs, you have some of that. 
All right. So that's not going to not be the case. But for the majority part, you have excitement and you have more involvement than I would say than a regular uh, uh, project. So I hope this video was helpful. Um, I know it's quite long, but I am very confident that if you follow some of these principles, you definitely start doing mini project PBLs and you'll be able to do a PBL. And I'm pretty confident that if you continue um, doing PBLs, you'll see a lot more autonomy, um, a lot more um, student success, even if they're small gains. Maybe it's not like they didn't score any different or any higher than on certain like statewide tests, but you might see, uh, in a way, I would say more expression, more engagement in the class. And I'm pretty sure once that happens, the scores are going to change because personally speaking, they have for me. I've never gotten uh, the high, I got one of, I got the highest scores I ever got by doing PBLs. Like, um, I, my scores increased from where I started in school that had nothing to do with PBL to PBL substantially. It was, it's, it was by 10 points, 10 average points. Um, it was pretty crazy when I would see that a whole 10 points, 10% of final grades, like in, um, talking about benchmark tests, 10 point difference. That's big time. Um, from where I, I don't know, maybe it's not for you, but from schools where I've been, people are fighting over like one or two points. I'm talking about 10 points. Um, but then again, being realistic, um, you know, I was in a very structured program. Um, and I think at the end of the day, um, probably my efforts were like four or five points while um, being in that program was like five to six points. But four points or four to five points is better than zero points. And it's also way better than negative four or five points. So um, those are my experiences. And I think uh, um, it possibly can happen to you as well. So thanks. And hopefully this was helpful.